Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's installment of C-Suite Snacks. My name is Steve Ronan, the leader of Citrin Cooperman's consulting and outsourcing practices and the host of today's webinar. It's hard to think of a business topic that captures more of the public imagination than the emerging cannabis industry. From medicinal use in edibles to dispensaries, growers, devices, and facilities, as state regulations change each year, the business of growing, processing, distributing, and supporting the industry changes. With each of these changes comes new opportunities and new businesses. And today we're joined by Mitzi Keating, the founder of our cannabis advisory services practice to demystify the industry and broadly talk about the structural tax and financial considerations in play for both active and budding participants in the industry. A few administrative reminders before we start, we accept questions throughout the webinar through the Q&A function of Zoom. So please locate the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and feel free to enter your questions in there as they uh, come up. We will be saving time at the end of today's presentation for questions and we'll also answer some uh, during the course of today's discussion. Finally, if you're here because you found it on our website or on social media, I encourage you to visit our C-Suite Snacks Hub to sign up for our mailing list and make sure you receive our invites every week for our snack size topics and also to view prior uh, webinar recordings, decks, and get the contact information for uh, topics of interest. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mitzi Keating to begin today's session. Mitzi, over to you. All right, thanks, Steve. I appreciate the introduction and thank you for having me here today to talk to you guys about the cannabis industry. Uh, as Steve mentioned, you know, this is a very hot topic out there in the business world with regard to the fact that we still have a federally illegal, but yet state legal in certain states business model that exists out there, highly regulated industries. So I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, an overview about the industry today so that you can understand some of the challenges that these business owners or those who are contemplating getting into the cannabis business actually face as they move forward in trying to open up a business. So I will start with a disclaimer that we have to put up here when we deal with the cannabis industry to just remind everybody that certainly cannabis is still federally illegal. It is contained on the schedule of controlled substances as a schedule one drug, and that by participating or watching or dealing with this webinar in any way, shape or form, that this is not to assist in any way with the violation of applicable law. So again, my name is Mitzi Keating. I am the founder and I'm a practice leader within the Cannabis Advisory Services Group. I'm a CPA and a CFE, which is a certified fraud examiner for those of you who don't know, which actually is pretty instrumental with regard to dealing with the cannabis industry, which I'll talk to you about today. So without further ado, what I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to go over three major topics. We're going to talk about the cannabis industry, what it is, some of the challenges associated with the cannabis industry. Then we're going to get into everybody's favorite topic, which is the taxation of the cannabis industry, which if you've never heard of code section 280E, you may be surprised to really understand how these cannabis businesses are taxed because although they're, again, state legal and they're federally illegal, it's not the federal illegality that taxes them in such a drastic manner. It happens to be because they're trafficking in controlled substances under the meaning of the Controlled Substances Act. And then we'll talk about cash flow and fraud risks related to this industry to kind of give you an overview of exactly how these businesses fare out there in the marketplace. So to start, um, what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, is the overview of the cannabis industry. So again, as I mentioned, in the cannabis industry, we kind of have this bizarre dichotomy where it's still a federally illegal substance. And so from a federal perspective, the entire industry, those who are dispensaries, cultivators, importers, those who are working as distributors within the industry still face the fact that they are committing a federal crime every single time that they are engaging in this business. And yet in certain states, we have both medicinal use legality or we have adult use legality. I happen to be located in the state of Massachusetts, which happens to be a, both a recreationally legal and a medically legal state. So as it stands today, we have 17 different states that have legalized cannabis for recreational use. That includes some of the more recent states that you may have heard about legalizing within the past month, including both New Jersey that went last year with a ballot initiative and the state of New York, which just kind of legalized through the budget process in this past year. In addition to that, we have 36 states across the country that have legalized cannabis on a medical basis. There's also a, a decriminalization factor that has happened in a number of different states. 
where states have actually decriminalized marijuana such that those who have been or get accused or are caught with cannabis in their possession have a lack of criminal prosecution related to it in certain circumstances. The only state that actually has no laws on the books related to any sort of legalization or decriminalization is Idaho, which is kind of an interesting fact. And there was an interesting case actually with regard to hemp and a hemp transporter, although hemp is very different from cannabis in terms of how it's treated from a federal legality perspective under the 2018 Farm Bill. What happened was there was a, a truck driver that was driving through the state of Ohio and, oh, uh, sorry, Idaho, and Idaho actually seized the hemp shipment, believing that it could have been cannabis. And uh, there was a whole big to do related to it because both hemp and cannabis are, are derivatives of the same plant and are somewhat indistinguishable to a, a federal agent or to a state agent. That being said, as I mentioned, that cannabis is actually a Schedule One drug under the Controlled Substances Act. A Controlled Substances Act kind of categorizes drugs into different categories based upon their severity and likelihood of abuse and their lack of medicinal approval. Uh, it's somewhat interesting as we have some FDA approved cannabis derivative drugs which exist currently in the United States that the federal government also allows for federal medical research on cannabis, but yet cannabis is still scheduled, is still treated as a schedule one drug in accordance with the Controlled Substances Act. Some of the issues that the cannabis businesses face that other businesses don't necessarily face relate to banking challenges. Uh, it's very difficult for cannabis companies to find banks. They deal mainly with cash. Uh, they can accept debit cards. They can't accept credit card payments. So when you look at that and you look at the starting and kind of how a cannabis business is going to really get off the ground, the first thing they need to do is to find a cannabis friendly bank. And in various states, there are some banks and credit union state chartered banks that will deal with the cannabis industry. But mainly when you look at the fact that banks who are FDIC insured or who are fearful of federal prosecution from the banking regulators, will not necessarily deal with cannabis. We'll talk about what's being done at the federal level to address those challenges. Same thing with insurance companies. And again, we'll talk about that. But in the cannabis industry, you have to remember too, it's highly regulated. And each state has its own set of regulations with regard to cannabis. And when you look at that, combined with the banking challenges, the insurance challenges, there's pretty much a hurdle at every single corner for these cannabis businesses. So what starts with an idea to get into a brand new industry, although it's not brand new, it's been around for quite some time, it just hasn't been legal. It, there are a lot of challenges along the way for these cannabis business owners. So as I mentioned, if you take a look, we, we always have a map and the map keeps changing constantly. And sometimes even by the time we finish creating a slideshow for a presentation, we have to color additional states or color them differently on the map. But this is where you can kind of see from the perspective as it stands today, that states with legal use of marijuana, you see all the blue states are the ones that are both recreationally and medically legal. You have um, you know, certain states which are just medicinally legal, and you have some states that really just deal with CBD as a legality. And those that have a D on the, on the map itself are really decriminalized states. So this is really where we stand with the domestic industry. And if we kind of move to the global industry, the cannabis global industry is, is another animal that we can deal with in an entirely different webinar uh, for those who are interested. But with regard to the global industry, there are certain countries that have legalized cannabis across their countries for recreational use. The one that's most close to us, of course, is, this, is Canada. So Canada who legalized recreational use of cannabis in 2018, really kind of was a trendsetter for a lot of our domestic businesses which you'll see in the marketplace, there's a lot of Canadian publicly traded companies that invest down in US cannabis businesses. But you can see the stats here, the global sales in 2018, 9.1 billion, 2019, sorry, 18, 2019 global sales, 14.8 billion. It, it's just a growing industry. It's growing very rapidly. And then if you look at the US sales, you know, anticipated sales, we're looking at $34.5 billion in 2025. Those statistics and anytime you see statistics of what the industry actually is going to look like in cannabis, it, they change dramatically because it depends upon how quickly a state who's legalized cannabis for adult use and typically adult use over medical use that brings in quite a bit of tax revenue to that state. 
it, it depends upon how quickly the regulatory environment can be created to really control the cannabis licensing process in that state that determines how quickly we'll see the global industry or the, the domestic industry really increase. So I mentioned one other thing that a lot of people aren't aware of with regard to the cannabis industry. So there's a nice code section, and, and this is great because although I'm not a tax partner, I really only have to deal with a couple different code sections when it comes to cannabis. And one of them is really 280E. And what 280E says is that no deduction or credit shall be allowed for any amount paid or incurred during the taxable year in carrying on any trader business if such trader business or the activities that comprise such trader business consists of trafficking in controlled substances within the meaning of Schedule I or II of the Controlled Substances Act, which is prohibited by federal law or the law of the state in any such trader business is conducted. What does that really mean? Well, what that means is that cannabis businesses get no deductions or credits from taxable income and determining taxable income on their tax return. Now, one thing just to be aware of is that cost of goods sold is considered to be an adjustment to income, not a deduction. So the IRS at least gives a little bit of, uh, I won't say legislative grace, but um, you know when it comes to the 16th Amendment and Congress having the power to tax income from whatever source derived, we do have the ability to deduct cost of goods sold essentially from gross revenue in arriving at taxable income. So as you can see in this slight example that I have here, if you have two different stores, say you have a candy store and you have a cannabis dispensary, and maybe I should use two businesses that might look a little bit different you know, from each other in that regard, but if you have revenue of a million dollars and typically you have cost of goods sold in the cannabis industry with a margin of about 50%, you end up with gross margin at 500,000. With your selling general and administrative expenses of 300,000, you'd have pre-tax net income of $200,000. So if you're a candy store, you're gonna get taxed on $200,000 of taxable income. If you're a cannabis company, you're gonna get taxed on $500,000 of taxable income. And when you really kind of do out the math, if you're really looking at a 40% tax rate, at the end of the day, your cannabis company has no cash left at the end of the day. So when we look at a couple of different things and kind of risks in EBITDA and calculations, and you may have heard a lot out there about the valuations of these cannabis companies. And, and this Canadian publicly traded company is acquiring these domestic companies and the valuation is $200 million or $300 million. The issue is that a lot of the standard valuation techniques and when people talk about EBITDA, in the cannabis industry, you really have to adjust EBITDA and understand the industry and what the industry does with regard to EBITDA because the tax implications of not being able to deduct any, anything other than really cost of goods sold makes it such that it's a lot more difficult to obtain cash flow and to really have free cash flow in these cannabis businesses. A lot of the things we're seeing out there um, constantly we're seeing more and more shareholder disputes because people are selling shares or they're uh, having, you know, they're raising funds at a valuation that is $50 million for 1% you know, of their company. So they'll, they'll sell 1% you know, of their company at a valuation of $50 million. They go through private placement memorandums and they go through private you know, friends and family funding because what doesn't happen in the cannabis industry is that we don't have bank lending to the cannabis industry. So as I mentioned before about the banking challenges, another banking challenge involves the fact that these companies are really funded through private investment into these companies. And if they're funded by debt, the interest rates on some of these debt agreements end up being, I saw at the beginning of the industry in Massachusetts, we're closer to 18%. And now they're kind of hovering somewhere between 10 and 12%. So it's a high cost of capital in order to even start these companies. The shareholder disputes are really kind of coming to fruition based upon a misalignment of the investor's expectations and the actual results in cash flow from these cannabis companies. So as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of different issues associated with what might be typically determinable of EBITDA and what your rate of return might be that in cannabis, if you remember that EBITDA is almost a, a meaningless measure because earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, if we look back at that other $1 million of revenue example, 
the cash flow, the actual cash flow of this company is really zero. And so it doesn't really matter when you kind of back into it um, from that perspective. You don't get depreciation. You don't get amortization. If you have high interest costs because you are funded through high interest debt, it's all cash flow related. And what's really left for investors at the end of the day? And so that's something that really needs to be considered. The structure, corporate, pass-through, pass-through entities can give a lot more of an issue by issuing phantom income to investors in cannabis companies. And then there's a number of different things where, you know, if you're publicly traded in Canada and you're measuring your financial statements based upon IFRS and not US GAAP, you end up in a situation where you have something called biological assets. And so under international financial reporting standards, you actually mark your inventory to market value at the end of each year, which is very different from the cost-based methodology that's, that's done in US GAAP. So briefly, I'm gonna just touch on understanding cannabis funding structures. Because as I mentioned, if you're investing into these cannabis companies or you have any desire to invest into these cannabis companies, you really need to understand what the impact of taxation and the corporate structure really does to funding these cannabis companies. So for example, as I mentioned, with partnerships typically in an operating agreement, you'll have a distribution, a tax distribution based upon taxable income that's to be distributed to its members, which you know, most cases is somewhere around 45%, might be a 45% distribution. If I'm looking at this partnership one with an investment, I'm gonna invest a million dollars into it. I have pre-tax net income of $200,000, but remember, it's a cannabis company, so I have taxable income of $500,000. My operating agreement says we're gonna distribute 45% of uh, taxable income out to its members. So the distribution that's coming out to members is gonna be $225,000. I only had $200,000. At the end of the day, that was pre-tax net income. I have to pay, although it's a partnership, so it doesn't pay tax on its own. The cash flow, in order for me to meet my operating agreement, means I need to get $25,000 from somebody else to be able to pay out my tax distributions and my operating agreement. Doesn't really look good um, if you kind of think about exactly where is that $25,000 coming for me to pay the existing members. Same thing with a partnership. I have a second partnership. You know, if it's based upon available cash flow, not a set percentage from the operating agreement, I may in this case not have any cash flow and I may not distribute anything. So you, as an investor in this partnership, may have phantom income coming to you on your K-1 for which you have no tax distribution to cover it. Corporate, uh, corporations are, are favored in some cases in the cannabis industry because they block the corporate tax and it becomes the responsibility of the corporation as opposed to the members. And you can see as it stands right now, I put Massachusetts as a rate on here for 8%, but you're looking at 29% tax rate on again, $500,000 of taxable income. So at the end of the day, the corporation still has positive cash flow of $55,000 if it's set up this way. But again, if I'm an investor in a corporation, that's all that's left at this point in time to distribute for a dividend. One of the issues with cannabis companies is the corporate structure. And we've seen this evolve over time in terms of how these entities are structured and the common question I have is, how can I get away from 280E? What can I do to avoid taxation under 280E? And the answer is not much of anything. We have very little court cases through tax court that really address any companies that are trying to either get around 280E or who have tried to go to tax court claiming that 280E is unconstitutional. And in every single case, the tax court has said no, this is not the case, 280E exists, you are trafficking in controlled substances, although we haven't fully defined which entities, if you have a real estate entity or other ancillary businesses, which ones the tax court might decide are actually considered to be trafficking in controlled substances. So people try to set up these companies, I'm gonna have a management services agreement, I'm gonna have a payroll company because those shouldn't be subject to 280E. Well, we have a couple court cases that came in both Harborside and Alternative Health, which were court cases that were issued in 2018. And those are our most recent court cases that really kind of tell us, you know, the IRS is going to look at the economics of your entire structure. And it's very likely that your structure will be subject to either structural collapse, where all entities within the structure are going to be subject to 280E, and maybe you've created artificial income within your structure that's also then subject to double taxation because of the way that you've structured it, 
Or the reality is that the reach of 280E may extend to those other companies that you've created, which really in an, or, or really together create one economic enterprise, which is really having a cannabis company or really, you know, the purpose is, is to sell cannabis. So there's a lot of structural issues that really need to be considered when we look at cannabis companies. So the last piece I'm just gonna talk about is some of the fraud risks and what we see with litigation in the corporate structure. So again, if I'm an investor and I'm looking at this cannabis company, I, I get this fancy private placement memorandum with these you know, 42 pages of risk disclosures, but do you really know what you're investing in? If the corporate structure includes a number of different entities, you may not actually know what you might be investing in to determine what you may be subject to or what you may actually receive at any point in time in profits. In addition to that, you know, what are the related party transactions that we see in these structures? Rent, management fees, cross charges. Are those companies that they're charging rent, management fees and cross charges to, are they owned, do you own the same percentage of them? You know, where, is, where are the funds being, what I'll say is bled out of the corporate structure? Do you understand the operating agreement if it's a partnership? Do you understand the waterfall provisions and what you could be entitled to in the event of a sale? Uh, preferential returns? And, and what about the cash flow and impact of tax distributions? As I mentioned in that partnership arrangement where, you know, if we had a 45% mandatory tax distribution to cover taxable income, but I don't actually have the cash in the company to distribute that out, well, where's that additional cash coming from? And in some cases, we've seen that it's come from a new investors walking into the, the structure. And then you have to kind of consider the risks of the regulatory concerns and issues. And as I mentioned very briefly, this is a highly regulated environment and it's a highly regulated industry. Each state has its own set of rules uh, with regard to license limitations, suitability, who's allowed to do what with regard to these licenses. And always remember that you can't actually sell cannabis from state to state. It can't cross state lines because it's federally illegal. So there's a number of different issues to kind of consider. And in my last slide, just related to the overall industry risks, if you're gonna invest in this industry, or you're gonna get involved in the industry, certainly take the time to understand the industry and you know, be careful of those who are trying to get licenses if you don't have funding. There are a lot of scams related to those people who are looking to make a quick dollar on people who are desperate to get into this industry. Um, as I mentioned, investors seem to want to jump on and they don't wanna get left behind, but you know, in a lot of cases, the valuations don't make any sense of some of these cannabis companies. I said false lenders. There's a pay-to-play environment out there sometimes. I'll pay you $500,000 because you're going to give me $5 million so I can build out my facility. These internal, these, uh, sorry, indoor grows can cost upwards of $15, $20 million. They're, they're highly capital intensive uh, businesses when you're looking at the cultivation facilities. Again, competition in a highly regulated environment. I didn't even mention anything with regard to the economics of a cannabis business. And it's not just supply and demand, but you know, the reality is that there's only so much demand. And you know, depending upon the state rules and requirements on license limitations, each state is a different environment to consider. All in all, again, cannabis is federally illegal. You can't discount the impact on taxes. And certainly, um, just to go back to my roots as a CFE, you always have to remember the fraud triangle. There is a lot of fraud in this industry. You have to be aware of it, and you need to make sure that you're really um, you know, doing your due diligence. So that being said, I will take any questions that Steve is willing to throw my way. Yeah, terrific, Mitzi. Thanks so much. It's just continue. It's like every time we do one of these presentations, it, things, it feels like things have materially shifted since the last one. It's amazing how fast this moves. Absolutely. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, we've got some questions coming into the Q&A window right now. Uh, go ahead and, and submit your questions uh, now as we go. If we, if we can't get to any, we'll have Mitzi follow up afterwards uh, with answers. So um, the first one uh, came in, I think, when you were talking about uh, the, uh, the funding structures and, and company structures. How, how does all of that and the taxation impact distribution companies that aren't involved in growing or selling it but are intermediaries? Yeah, so depending upon the state, you could have a distribution company um, where it might be part of the value add process, but also in some states like Massachusetts, you have a delivery company, which is kind of taking from the end consumer and driving it to the homes of, of uh, taking it from the end producer and driving it to the homes of the consumer. It, we have real issues with regard to the taxation of those companies because 
really all you get through 280E, as I mentioned, is an adjustment to income for cost of goods sold. And if you don't, and that's really based upon inventory and full absorption costing of your inventory. If you have no inventory, you don't have title to the inventory, we would conclude that you don't have any deductions. So be wary of those if it's a service business really that has no inventory, you're going to be taxed on your gross, your, your gross revenue. Great, makes sense. Uh, next one, uh, Puerto Rico. Does Puerto Rico fall under two, 280E? It's funny because Puerto Rico is a, a different animal. And uh, for that, we probably have to get our international tax folks involved on that because everybody uh, seems to think that we can go down to Puerto Rico. They do have their own you know, rules with regard to federal tax, but most of the time they're US citizens who live here and not in Puerto Rico, not that those in, in Puerto Rico are not US citizens, but it, you have to be considerate about, or you have to be careful about the fact that if you own a Puerto Rico company or a Puerto Rican company, what does that do for you from a US taxation perspective? Because remember you are the domestic taxpayer. And so unless you live and work in Puerto Rico, there's many other international tax considerations to consider. Great. What about that? Uh, what about the Safe Banking Act? What what uh, what can you expect the the impact of that to be kind of on this this industry at a macro level? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the fact that third time's a charm, right? So the House recently just passed the uh, the Safe Banking Act for the third time. Uh, it's never really been taken up by the Senate. Uh, there's hope that it will be taken up by the Senate this year. And what will that do? I think there's a misconception out there that once the Safe Banking Act is opened up that a number of different banks are gonna jump into the industry, they're gonna lend into the industry and they're going to be, you know, it's going to regulate the industry from a, a cash flow perspective a little bit better. But the issue with that is that the banks still have to file their, they have to comply with their anti-money laundering rules and they have to file their suspicious activity reports. And all it really does is it gives protection to the banks so that they won't be subject to federal prosecution, they won't lose their FDIC insurance, and the insurance providers can service the industry. It doesn't take away any of the regulatory issues associated with it. Will I see maybe over time we'll start to see some more lending into the industry by the banking community? Probably, which would be helpful because a lot of these businesses that are trying to start up really do have to go to friends and family to be able to fund their businesses. But I don't think it's going to be a dramatic change that people seem to anticipate it will be. But I think you'll see a reaction in the, the Canadian public markets related to if and when that passes. No, it is a good step. Yeah, yeah, interesting. We'll have, and we're we're tracking that closely uh, as it evolves. So you know, stay in touch with our uh, thought leadership on that one. Let's fit two quick, two more quick ones in, if you don't mind, Betsy. No problem. Um, so <laughs> something you and I have talked about quite a bit. Uh, any advice for service providers on how to approach cannabis companies? Yeah, I mean, service providers really um, jump in with both feet. Um, if you're comfortable doing so, right? Um, because it's a very tricky industry. It's really important to make sure that you understand what's going on with the industry, but be careful because early on in the industry, if you were a service provider and you were deriving a lot of revenue from cannabis companies, your bank may call you up and say, I'm sorry, but we see that you're bringing in money from cannabis companies. We're going to shut down your bank account. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of other considerations, your insurance considerations. Certainly for us, our malpractice insurance considerations are high. So there's a number of different things with service providers that they need to just understand. Great. And then uh, last one, and I don't know how you answer this in summary, but I'll give you a <laughs> shot. Do cannabis companies make money? Uh, yes and no. Um, I will say that certain of them do. Uh, it really depends upon the characteristics of the company, how they were funded, whether or not they have high interest rates, um, you know, whether or not they're they're able to kind of corner the right place in the market and they have the right license. But it, to say a blanket statement overall, I've seen plenty of cannabis companies that do not make money. And in mature markets such as uh, Colorado, uh, Washington State, there's plenty of businesses that have gone out of business. Hmm. Well, uh, Mitzi, that's that's terrific. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, we kept your contact information up there uh, throughout the Q&A period, so hopefully people noted that. Uh, this recording will be sent out. A link to the deck will be sent out. You'll get access to all of this, plus Mitzi's contact information if you'd like to have further discussions about cannabis. Today's Snack Basket giveaway, uh, which we do every week, is going to pay off for Michael Kennedy from uh, IPC today. So Michael... Congratulations, somebody from our team will be reaching out to you to get shipping information for our craft back basket of snacks. Appreciate you joining us. Um, continuing our weekly Thursday series next week, uh, we're gonna be taking the opportunity to dig into the restaurant industry 
and learning about what their path to recovery might be. Uh, we're going to be joined by Stacy Gilbert, who is uh, a partner and a restaurant industry leader, as well as Denise Koch, a principal in the restaurant practice as well. Um, and on the 20th, we're going to be taking a look at middle market M&A trends, what you can do to prepare your business and whether or not you should go to market sooner or later. Uh, and we'll be joined by Ramsey Goodrich from Carter, uh, Morrison Goodrich for that session. So please consider joining us for both of those. The registration, as always, can be found on our C-Suite Snacks Hub the week of the presentation. So thanks again for joining today. We hope you guys have a great rest of your week and look forward to seeing you.